Today we're going to talk about bleeding control and I'm going to review the conventional methods of bleeding control and talk about some old practices that are coming back into fashion and some newer technologies that are available to help you control bleeding in a pre-hospital environment. Let me review some of the basics of bleeding control just as a refresher. If our patient here was to have a serious laceration on his wrist, the first thing that we would use to control it would be direct pressure. And we'll do that with a dressing that's of sufficient size to actually cover the wound, but not so large that it would continue to absorb blood without giving us an indication that blood's continuing to come from the wound itself. So we'll choose a four by four dressing in this situation, and we'll apply it directly over the wound surface and just put some direct pressure on the wound. 90% of external bleeding is controlled with direct pressure alone. If the wound continued to bleed, we'd know that by the dressing starting to saturate with blood. It's not necessary, nor really a smart idea, to lift the dressing up to look at the wound because it removes clot and debris that is actually helping to control the bleeding. If the dressing continues to saturate with blood, we'd add an additional dressing onto it. And we can ask the patient to put pressure on the wound to help to continue the direct pressure. Open up another bandage, put that on it, and our next step would be to elevate the wound above the level of the heart. So we'll do that with our patient here. If the bleeding were to continue at this point, we would apply pressure to a pressure point. And in this case, the brachial artery in the upper arm would be the pressure point. In a lower extremity wound, the femoral artery would be a useful pressure point. There are some spots on the body, such as the head, where there are no suitable pressure points to use. If that was not to control the bleeding, the next step would be to put a pressure bandage over the wound. And we could do that using a cravat, wrapping it around the wound, tying it, or taking some Curlex and wrapping that around the wound, continuing to add bandages as the wound bled. That said, there are some new things that are coming back into fashion, and one of those is use of a tourniquet. I want to talk about the use of a tourniquet a little bit and why that practice is now becoming popular again. The reason that's occurred is because of the experience of our military. Virtually 10% of battlefield deaths result from exsanguination. That translates into 60% of preventable deaths of soldiers on the battlefield. As a consequence of that discovery, the military has moved bleeding control to the first priority in patient care. That means that prior to airway and prior to breathing, control of serious external bleeding takes precedence. For the military, the use of the tourniquet has become a mainstay of control of external hemorrhage in the battlefield. In our application in civilian world, there are actually four situations when a tourniquet may be of use to the EMS responder. The first of those situations would be when there's a life threat that causes external hemorrhage to take precedence over control of an airway. Application of a tourniquet initially, before any other steps of external bleeding, may slow the bleeding and allow the provider to turn to management of the airway in the patient, returning to control of the bleeding after the airway has been secured. The second situation where the tourniquet may be of use to a provider in the field would be an extremity bleeding that's not controlled by conventional means, the steps that we've just reviewed, direct pressure, elevation, use of a pressure point, and a pressure bandage. When bleeding persists beyond that, tourniquets may be a helpful means of controlling the hemorrhage. The third indication for use of a tourniquet would be when a limb that's entrapped is inaccessible to rescuers. And most of the time that would occur in a motor vehicle crash where an extremity is pinned underneath the dash or someplace where the rescuers are unable to get to it to apply direct pressure, to do elevation, or to use other means of controlling hemorrhage. That could also be seen in industrial accidents where people are trapped or pinned in machinery. The fourth indication when a tourniquet might be considered in a pre-hospital use is in a mass casualty incident where multiple patients with severe hemorrhage overwhelm the resources of the rescuer. Tourniquets could be applied rapidly to all of the patients and then go back to control bleeding on a one-by-one -one fashion as the resources become available. So those are four thoughts. 
that the medical literature currently supports for use of a tourniquet. Let me talk a little bit and demonstrate to you how you would apply a tourniquet. The first way you might want to consider applying a tourniquet is what's done in the operating room when tourniquets are used for control of bleeding in a surgical field, and that's to use a blood pressure cuff. In our patient who has an extremity injury to his wrist, we could apply a blood pressure cuff to his arm and inflate the blood pressure cuff beyond what the patient's systolic blood pressure is and gain control of the bleeding simply through use of the blood pressure cuff. In this situation, we'd need to know what the patient's pressure is. We'd inflate the cuff until we got beyond that systolic pressure and leave it inflated at that point and definitely would see some control of the bleeding distal to where the cuff is applied. The more conventional application of a tourniquet would involve using either a commercial tourniquet or taking a cravat, as you probably learned in your initial EMS training, and applying the cravat in a fashion so that its width is about the size of a fist in diameter so that it doesn't cause injury to the soft tissue, wrapping that above the level of the injury somewhere in the range of one to two inches above where the bleeding is actually occurring, and then finding something that will tighten that device around the skin, which oftentimes could be done with tongue depressors. And I'll tie the device so that you can actually see the use of the tongue depressors. And what I've done is secure the tongue depressors in a knot attached to the bandage. And I'll then twist the depressors until the bandage is tight enough that the bleeding is controlled distal to where the tourniquet has been applied. To keep the tongue depressors in place, it's often necessary to secure them with an additional wrap around the extremity so that they don't windmill back and loosen the tourniquet on the patient's extremity. The last topic I want to talk about is use of hemostatic agents to control bleeding. The state of the art in the operating room has turned to bandages and chemicals that are able to induce clotting right at the site of bleeding. Those bandages and those chemicals are now available to the pre-hospital provider and even to consumers for use in controlling bleeding. One such agent that is used by EMS providers is the quick clot first response bandage. This is a gauze bandage that's impregnated with components that induce clotting at the site of bleeding. Application of a hemostatic bandage, such as the quick clot, is done directly to the site where the bleeding is occurring. It can be used at any point in the process of controlling external bleeding from the initial application of the bandage all the way to the application of a tourniquet. What's necessary is for the bandage itself to be applied directly to the site of bleeding. This is one instance where you would actually remove bandages that were placed prior to the application of the hemostatic bandage. In this patient, we'll remove the pressure bandage that's been applied expose the area that's actually bleeding, and place the hemostatic bandage on the wound itself. The rest of the principles continue to apply. We would place other bandages on top of those, apply direct pressure, we would elevate the extremity, we would use pressure on a pressure point, and we would apply a pressure bandage. Hemostatic agents are probably going to become the state of the art for pre-hospital control of serious external hemorrhage, just like they are in the hospital setting. I'm Mike McAvoy. Thanks for watching.